Merry Christmas. It's my pleasure to welcome you to church tonight. I know we might have some guests with us. Maybe you came tonight and maybe you're even a little uncertain about being here. Your mom may be like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know what I think about this. And maybe you're even a little hesitant. Like, I don't know what these other people think about me being here. If they knew the things that were going on in my life, I don't know if they'd want me here. I just want you to know you're at a church with no perfect people in it. And we're glad that you're here. So if this is your home church, can you just help me welcome our guests tonight? Just anyone who's... Yes, we're glad that you're here. Uh, I love Christmas, so this is always one of my favorite times of the year, all the Christmas celebrations. I love decorating. I love giving the gifts. And one of the things I've come to really enjoy are the lights. I like the lights now, and it wasn't always that way. Uh, at one time, I just viewed the lights as more of a hassle. When I was a newlywed, my sweet wife asked me to go and put lights up on our house, and I was not pumped about it, honestly. I'm thinking, are you serious? This is another chore I gotta do now on top of wrapping terribly the presents that I got you? I'm like, I gotta go buy lights because I don't have any of those. I gotta go buy a ladder because I don't have one of those. And then I gotta risk my life hanging these lights up just to take them all down again three weeks later? Like, what's the point? And I even asked her, I'm like, what's the point? And she looked at me, and then I went out and hung those lights up. <laughs> Because I was a newlywed, and she's pretty. And that's pretty much what I thought Christmas lights were all about. For years, I was like, okay, girls are sentimental and think lights are pretty. Guys think girls are pretty. Boom, lights. And then I've learned it's, it's a lot more than that. I got a toddler, and I learned that Christmas lights are limitless, free entertainment. Isn't it wonderful? You can just walk around the neighborhood with your kids, and they're just entertained. They love looking at all the lights. I love that. Well, Christmas lights are actually the most powerful symbol of Christmas. And if you type Christmas into your phone, you know, the little emojis will auto-populate. Little, little, they're like Christmas Santa Claus, a tree. Those things will pop up. That makes sense. But really, the lights are the most powerful representation of of Christmas that there is. So, you know, if you've got neighbors probably with lights on their houses, many of them would say they're not really religious. A lot of them would say they don't really believe in Jesus, uh, but they don't maybe understand that they have the most powerful representation of Christmas on their house by lighting their house up. It goes all the way back to the first Christmas. In Luke chapter 2, it says that the angels appeared to these shepherds who were watching over their flocks at night, and the glory of God was shining all around these angels. There's light. And in Matthew chapter 2, it says that uh, the wise men were guided to Jesus by a star. A star gives off light. And it just kind of builds and it builds and it culminates with a greater, brighter light. Jesus, in Luke chapter 1, as it's kind of kicking off the Christmas story, it talks about Jesus and it says that he came to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun, talking about Jesus, will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. So I want to talk tonight about light in the darkness. Light in the darkness. It's a good thing that we celebrate Christmas every year because we need an ongoing, regular, repetitive reminder that we always have hope regardless of how much darkness there might be in the world around us. And there is darkness around us. And I think we have to acknowledge that. We live in a culturally Christian society still. So when we get into December, the Christmas carols come on in the mall and the commercials change and the parties get planned. And we kind of kick off all the festivities and sometimes we skip past the point of Christmas. And I like festivities. Amen. I'm going to party for Christmas anyone? You know, maybe tonight you're going to go out hang out with some people you love. Uh, but if you skip past the point of Christmas, the festivities become pointless. You got to understand the point is that we human beings were trapped in evil, sinful darkness and we needed a lasting saving light to rescue us. There is darkness in our world, and not just the Grinch or Darth Vader, uh, but there's real evil. And I want to talk about it for a minute. There are two unhealthy ways to deal with darkness. The first thing people do is they obsess over it. 
I see a lot of people, they just kind of obsess over. Maybe you don't realize you're doing this even, but maybe you're obsessing over the darkness in our world. It could be that you just constantly are watching the news and you're just waiting for the next disaster headline to come across. Maybe you're that person who watches all the true crime documentaries and you know all the ways that serial killers are out there killing people right now. Maybe you're the doomsday prepper. Uh, maybe you're going to hang out with a doomsday prepper uncle tomorrow who's got a bunker in his basement who always wants to talk about how the world's going to end. You could just be obsessed with darkness and what's wrong or what could be wrong or what's broken or missing in your life. And I think that's why people get so sad around the holidays. Think about how, how irrational that is. Why do people get so sad and depressed around Christmas? Why? Because, I mean, if you think about it, mostly everyone gets at least some extra time off of work, right? We got parties. We got cookies. We should be happy. <laughs> Why is everyone so sad? It's because at Christmas, you become more aware of how your real life doesn't always sync up with your ideal life. And that's true for everyone. Nobody's real life perfectly aligns with their ideal life. And, and instead of accepting that and just acknowledging that that's reality, people obsess over it, over what is disappointing, what was hurtful, what is missing in their lives. That leads to depression. So we don't want that. The other thing people do with darkness is they ignore it. They just say, I don't like the way this makes me feel. I'm going to change the channel. I'm going to put my head in the sand. I'm going to turn up the Christmas music. I don't want to think about dark things. I don't want to think about negative things. This is more of the denial approach. Denial. And there's a lot of ways to distract yourself from darkness and try to just kind of entertain it away, numb it away, binge watch Netflix shows, don't have to think about it. Uh, but, but neither of these things, obsessing or ignoring, leads to a lasting peace or joy. And that's what we all want. We all want joy. We all want peace. What is it that guards our feet to the path of peace? Luke 1 said, it's the shining light, the Son of God who came to earth from heaven. And we've got to recognize him and his role. But in order to recognize Jesus as the light, you have to acknowledge the darkness and that we're living in it. So I, I thought about it this way. When you honestly acknowledge the darkness around you, then you can appreciate the light that's come to you. There is a lot of darkness in our world, and there always has been. I'm not trying to be all emo, right? I'm going somewhere with this. But think about this scenario, right? Uh, you've you got a government that's oppressing its people and treating them unjustly and raising taxes and instituting curfews, and people don't have a lot of choice other than to just go along with it and make the best of it. You've got citizens that are totally divided. Some want to go with the flow and work with the government. Other people want to throw off oppression and reclaim their freedoms. The economy isn't as great as it once was. Families are struggling to make a living. Kids are going to bed hungry at night. And what was once the most prosperous nation on earth? Parts of the country that once were safe have become dangerous. You've got radicals who've taken their extremism to the streets because they're fed up with the way things are going. And many who once had faith have abandoned their upbringing. And now they've given up hope and are religious in name only. Uh, and so when you think about that, then in the middle of it, you've got a group of people who are crying out to God and asking God for help. Now, you might have thought I was describing America in 2021, but I was talking about ancient Palestine 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born. I love this part of the service. Every, every time people got all awkward and quiet, like, oh, no, he's getting political. No, I'm, I'm getting historical. I'm going back to Palestine. That was what was going on when Jesus was born. See, that's a good point. The Bible isn't an old book. It's a timeless book. It doesn't just tell you what happened. It tells you what always happens and what will happen. That's why we study the Bible. And God's word tells us that times were dark back then the same way that they're dark now. And we don't want to obsess over the sad and the disappointing parts of life, but we do need to acknowledge them. And I want to give you permission to acknowledge them. Because I think not everyone feels free to do that. I think sometimes we face a social pressure to project happiness even onto 
our disappointment. Or to all of a sudden, at Christmas time, act like you have a, a perfectly happy family when in reality people don't get along at all. Like, why, why is that? I think we just need to acknowledge that there's darkness in this world around us. We need to acknowledge some of the things we have to struggle with, like the fact sometimes our bodies let us down, and you get degeneration and cancer and sickness, and we have miscarriages and we have defects. It's just the way. Sometimes people get sick and they die, and some of you are mourning the loss of a loved one at Christmas time, like I am with my dad who died this year. We should acknowledge the fact that you could do everything right as a parent and you could love your kids and they could still grow up and act like they hate you. Or you could be a loving and devoted spouse and still end up divorced. Or let's acknowledge you could work hard and save and do everything according to the book, but then still others could tear down the life you worked to build. And a few Hallmark Christmas movies and stocking stuffers are not going to fix that or make it go away. (laughs) But acknowledging the darkness helps us to realize how much we need the light and appreciate the light that has come. That's Jesus who came. And Christmas is the story of Jesus coming to a weary world, crying out to God for divine intervention. Just like back then today, you have people who are struggling with governments around the world and crying out for help. You've got zealots taking revolution to the streets. You've got false messiahs and politicians. And you even in America have people who they grew up maybe Christian or around Christianity, but now they're just kind of going through the motions Christian in name only. And in the middle of all that, you've got people crying out to God for help now, just like back then, saying, God, help us. Longing. And that's one of my favorite Christmas songs is the one that expresses longing, like, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. O come, O bright and morning star, and bring us comfort from afar. Dispel the shadows of the night and turn our darkness into light. I I love this. So maybe you found yourself at times crying out to God, like, God, help me. I need, I know I have. God, help me. Help us. We need you. We are in trouble. And Christmas is where God first said, hold on, I'm coming. That's why Jesus came. He came to bring light into the darkness. And he went on to make it very clear that that's who he is. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's not one of many lights in the world. He's the light of the world. And you've got to understand that. Because I think there are people who they, they don't want to acknowledge that there's darkness in this world. And then when they do, they look for light in the wrong places. Let me give you some examples. People look for light in human relationships. Especially at Christmas, they think, you know, Christmas is about family. And we need to be together with family because that's where joy and peace comes from, those happy family moments. Well, some of you are going to be in trouble because you don't have happy families. (laughs) I had one person message me this week and they were like, Pastor, can I ask you a question? Uh, Do I have to hang out with my family? And I was like, what's wrong? They're like, well, they're like emotionally abusive and they just tear me down. And I always just feel terrible afterwards. Like, but I guess it's Christmas, you know? I'm like, no, you don't have to hang out with them. They sound terrible. (laughs) But, But people think like, well, that's what Christmas is about. It's family. But man, the truth is a lot of times family rarely loves you perfectly. And they will rarely give back as much as they take. And so you've got to find light somewhere else. Not in your earthly family, but by being adopted into God's family through faith in Jesus. Aren't you grateful you can be adopted into God's family? Some people look for light in human achievement. They think, man, if I can be successful and hit my numbers and get bonuses and get good stuff, cool stuff, newer stuff, then I'll have something to show for myself and my life will have meaning. The problem is... You could do everything right, and then someone else could shut the economy down. Or even if you do get a lot of cool stuff, um, you know, there's always nicer stuff. There's always newer stuff. Like, where does it end? That's why Jesus said in Mark 8, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? 
And like, I hope you're successful. It's good to want to be successful. I hope, you know, you get a huge Christmas bonus and then you tithe on it. I hope you have all kinds of great (laughs) blessing in your life. But that's not where we find light. That's not where we find hope. Some people look for light in human goodness. In human goodness. This is kind of like the Oprah theme, you know, like there's goodness in all of us. If we just come together and live in harmony and believe in ourselves uh, and we do more good than bad, then we'll have world peace. If we could just educate people better, we just need better education. If we could just get more equity in this world, then we'll have a better world. And I'm, I'm just like, well, how's that working out? How's that been working out for you? I got 10,000 years of human history that says it's not working out well. Because we pretty much never stop treating each other poorly, killing each other, and dividing over silly things. Like Humans are not good. That's why. It's because humans are not good. And some people are like, what? Yes, I am. I'm a good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. And... There's a whole chapter of the Bible that just focuses on that pretty much, like how you're not a good person. (laughs) It's like one of my favorite chapters. I love it. It just keeps it real. In Romans 3, it says that no one is good. It says in verse 23, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. But then there's good news. It's not just like a beat down. There's good news attached to this. It says, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So God makes it very clear. You could do good deeds every day for the rest of your life, and that still would not tip the scales in your favor and earn salvation or earn God's love. It would not make you a good person. Even one sin disqualifies you from entering into God's presence. And so all of us are disqualified. We cannot make our way to God. That's why God made his way to us. That's why Jesus came to earth and was born into human flesh. He became God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. God with us. God is with us. Aren't you grateful for that? I am. I'm grateful God is always with us. If we're being honest, though, sometimes it's easier to see that God is with you in the rearview mirror. Sometimes when you're in the middle of a hard situation, you don't always feel like God is with you. It's like when you're in high school and you like that really pretty girl, but she doesn't like you back. She breaks up with you. You know, she doesn't. And you're like, God, why? Where are you, God? And then you see the same girl 20 years later and you're like, oh, God was with me. You know? You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) God is always with us. (laughs) And here's what we see. Jesus came to be with us, to live perfectly for us, so he could die as us and give life to us. That's the good news right there. And when you recognize not just the darkness around you, but the darkness within you, That's when you can say, I'm a sinner. And then you realize, I need a savior. I have darkness in me, and the only thing that can drive that darkness out of me is the light of the world, the light of life. It's Jesus. So the joy of Christmas is not found in presents given under a tree. It's in Jesus who gave his life as the greatest gift and then was nailed to a tree for you. That's the light of life, Jesus Christ. And so my question would be then, if Jesus is the only name that saves, if he's the light of life, why doesn't everyone follow him? Why are there still people who are religiously apathetic or they're agnostic? Why are there so many other religions in this world, people who don't pay any attention to Jesus? Why are there people who they identify as a Christian on a survey, but then they don't actually give a rip about having a relationship with God? Why is that? It's because people are still living in darkness. Most people are. Even people with Christmas trees up in their house, a lot of them, most of them are still living in darkness. And the Bible talks about this darkness and how it blinds us. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see. Notice that? Unable to see 
the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. If you're wondering, what is God like? You look at Jesus. He's the exact likeness of God. But not everyone can see that because their eyes are spiritually clouded by the darkness of sin. It's when you put your faith in Jesus that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and you can finally see the light. It's like the other day I went to the chiropractor and I had had this pain in my neck and I was trying to fix it. You know, I was treating it with ice. I put heat on it. I took Tylenol. I was trying to do all the stretches and nothing worked. So I finally tried going to the chiropractor and man, he ripped that thing like a machine gun. It was like, pop, 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 pop. And I was like, oh, oh my goodness. I felt tingly all over. I felt just relief washed through my body. And I didn't even realize how out of alignment I was until I was fixed. And it's the same spiritually. It's not until Jesus opens your eyes that you realize how deceived you were by darkness. Like, do you, rem- do you remember when, when you were first saved? I remember when I was first saved, when I first encountered Jesus. It was like I breathed for the first time and I did not realize I had been holding my breath. When you first accept Jesus, that's when you first see how deceived you really were. You realize how lost you were, how sinful you were, how selfish you were. And it's when you first accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's when you first see how good God is and how patient God is and how merciful God is uh, and how much he's been loving you all along and calling you to come home. But it's not until you put your faith in him that you can really see all the truth about him. But that's why our church is here today, because someone came and told us the good news about the light, and we received that, and now we're here telling other people the good news about the light, and we want people to have their eyes open the way that ours were by Jesus. In Acts chapter 26, Jesus talked to the Apostle Paul, and he said, Yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes, so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. I'm glad that God opened our eyes. And he brought us from darkness to light. There's so much to be grateful for. Jesus, he came and he pierced through the darkness that had been clouding our vision. And he allowed us to see what's really true. And what he wants in return from us is just our adoration, our worship our devotion, and that's why we, we praise him. And we come to church and we praise him and people sing to him and they lift their hands. It's because you see how lost you were, how much darkness there was in you, and you see how good God is, how he saved you and he rescued you. But in order to save us, he had to first come and become one of us and he had to live for us and he had to pay the price for us. And it says in Colossians 1 that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's what Jesus did is he gave us a citizenship transfer from the the kingdom of darkness does not sound like a good place to live to the kingdom of God. That's where you want to be. I love this concept of transferring. Makes me think of Christmas, the white elephant gift exchanges that people do. Which is, it's wrong, I think, that we do that at Christmas because it's clearly demonic. It's, it's not from God. It's from the devil. Think about it, like Christmas. White, people are like taking each other's gifts and they're like, they're selfish and they're like all stealing from each other. It's terrible. It's terrible. But I like the concepts. I like the concept of, of trading a bad gift for a better gift. Because that's really Christianity. In a nutshell, that, that Jesus came and he performed a transfer. He gave us life in place of death. He gave us truth in place of lies. He gave us heaven in place of hell. He gave us wisdom in place of foolishness. He gave us unity in place of division. He gave us his righteousness in place of our sinfulness. He gave us forgiveness in place of bitterness. Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful that Jesus gave you the greatest gift ever? And then I want to just close by asking you this. Who wants to receive that tonight? Who wants to receive Jesus? Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. If you're here and you'd say, man, I want this. I want Jesus. I want the gift of salvation. 
Most of the people in the room have already received it, but there are probably people here who, who have not yet, and they need to. And maybe you didn't come to church expecting you get the best gift of all here. It's the gift of salvation that comes through Jesus. And if you want to accept him tonight, I just want to lead you in a prayer. And it's not magic or anything, but just to help you express what's in your heart. You can pray this with me if you say, yeah, tonight I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive the light of life. And I want to be adopted into God's family. I want to be forgiven of sin. Then let's pray together. Just pray with me wherever you're at. And just say, God, I need you. And I ask you to save me. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he lived the perfect life that I could not live. I believe he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. I believe he rose again so that I could have eternal life. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I receive forgiveness and I receive your love, God. I want to follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray.